Hello, everyone. This is the Freedom Bell, a podcast production of the Pacific Training Center for the Blind. Welcome to our first episode called Blind People in Charge. My name is Elizabeth Lalonde, and I'm honored to be your host. I'm joining you today from the Lekongwen Territory, the traditional lands of the Esquimalt and Songhees people, also known as Victoria, British Columbia. In this episode, I'm going to introduce myself, talk a little bit about my personal story as a blind person. I'm also going to introduce the Pacific Training Center for the Blind and how we started the center. And then finally broaden the discussion to talk about blindness as a social justice issue. I was born blind with an eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa. This is a retinal condition that affects the retina. Over time, the cells in the retina can deteriorate. I currently have just a little bit of sight, mainly light perception and some shapes and shadows, and a bit of side peripheral vision. It's quite common actually for people who are blind to have a little bit of vision. Only 10% of blind people are actually totally blind. I was born in Calgary, Alberta. My mom found out I was blind when I was about two years old. I was looking at my toys sideways, just moving around a little bit cautiously. My mom made an appointment with the eye doctor. As soon as the doctor looked into my eyes, he could tell that I was blind. That began my journey through life as a blind person. I've been very fortunate to have a wonderful mom and stepdad and grandparents who believed in me and encouraged me to try new things and take risks. We moved to Victoria with my grandparents and my mom when I was four years old. I was integrated into the regular school system. They thought I had enough sight to read large print. When I was little, I could see big black letters with some contrast, but even then it was hard. I used to use a lot of magnifying devices. One was a giant television screen called a CCTV, and I would put the book under. The print would appear on the screen in massive letters. I would have to sit at the back or the front, and I was quite slow. I felt obvious in the classroom doing this. Many of the children who were blind, who were a little bit older than me, actually went to Jericho Hill School for the Blind, which was a segregated system. Integration, of course, is vital for inclusivity for blind people and people with disabilities. The one problem with integration is that it doesn't always have enough specialized skills. For example, I wasn't taught Braille, which is literacy for blind people. I didn't learn Braille until high school, and then it never was integrated into my curriculum, which meant I didn't increase my speed. I actually have blind friends who can read Braille up to 200, 300 words a minute, which is as fast as some sighted people can read print. I love talking about Braille, and at some point I'll do a whole podcast episode about it. When I was in elementary school, I struggled along with print. I remember in grade seven in a science class, I was using that gargantuan CCTV. I tried to read my science test, but I broke down. I just couldn't read the print. I was so stressed. They called the itinerant teacher for the blind who brought me into another room and read me my exam. She wrote down my answers. I ended up getting an A on that test. After that, my marks improved. There was a breakthrough. They finally realized that print wasn't working for me, not that it ever did. The books were getting longer and the print was getting smaller. This was definitely the time for me to change over to a new way of doing things. From then on, I got all my books on cassette tape. I know I'm ancient. I got through university and high school with boxes of cassette tapes pretty funny. I got very efficient at it. I used to sit with two tape recorders, make notes on one tape recorder, listen to the book on the other. It's so much easier these days with the digital technology. At the time, I also got a talking computer. Actually, when I first started college, it was a new invention at the time. Hard to believe. It really made a big difference in my capacity. When I was in school, I also didn't get the chance to be with blind children very often. This caused a sense of isolation. I was different. I was nervous and embarrassed about using my white cane, especially when I was a teenager. But it was dangerous for me to get around without one. Finally, I did start using one when I became a young adult. Now I advocate strongly for using the long white cane. I work hard to promote how the white cane is a tool of independence and liberty. After graduating from high school, I went to the University of Victoria. I studied writing and anthropology. I did a double major. I loved university. It gave me an opportunity to meet so many different people. I joined the Society for Students with Disabilities and became president of that organization. 
this is where I really learned how to become an advocate. And I felt the need to educate people about blindness and disability in a more positive perspective in society. When I was just finishing university, I came across other blind people who introduced me to an organization in the United States called the National Federation of the Blind. This is a huge organization, very grassroots, and I'd never heard of it. It's a civil rights organization that's been working in the U.S. since the 1940s. I was privileged to be able to attend a convention in New Orleans in 1996. I was expecting there to be maybe a 200 blind people. I wasn't expecting it to be on the level it turned out to be. There were 3,000 blind people that attended that year. It was outstanding and empowering. I remember the sound of thousands of canes tapping, echoing all together. At that convention, I learned that there are training centers in the United States where blind Americans can go. It's publicly funded and they can learn blindness skills for six to nine months. We don't have anything like that in Canada. I knew I wanted to make things better for blind Canadians, improve the opportunities and allow blind people to have these important services. I got more involved with the National Federation of the Blind and became president of the Canadian Federation of the Blind. A smaller organization we started to promote a positive perspective of blindness and to encourage blind people to get together and advocate and mentor each other. My dream was taking root of starting a center in Canada, like the ones in the US. I wanted to be able to learn the model that they used. I had the opportunity to attend the Louisiana Center for the Blind. I was fortunate to receive a scholarship and I attended in 2010. This experience was life-changing. At the Louisiana Center for the Blind, I trained for almost a year. I was able to develop my blindness skills and learn how to do things completely non-visually without relying on that little bit of vision that I did have. Near the end, I cooked a meal for 40, which was a graduation project. I did drop routes where you get dropped off somewhere in the neighborhood and you find your way back to the center. I learned more advanced computer skills and I was reading Braille at about 60 words a minute when I left. In my graduation ceremony, I felt so empowered and I rang the freedom bell. The freedom bell is a bell that blind people who complete the training at the centers ring to mark becoming independent and free. We also ring the freedom bell whenever blind people feel a sense of accomplishment and pride. I came back home and then I didn't know what to do. How was I supposed to get started? I didn't know how to begin a nonprofit organization. I ended up taking a business course through a program called Entree Active, provided by Business Victoria for people with disabilities. I wrote a nonprofit business plan about how to start the Pacific Training Center for the Blind, and that set the groundwork. It provided me with plans that we're still making use of today at the center. I had a lot of support, and other blind people helped me to get it going. We became a charity in 2013. We started our first program, Blind People in Charge, with a grant from the provincial government of $50,000. We started at a local scouts hall, very grassroots. Participants came three days a week and they learned all different types of skills. Cane travel, braille, confidence building, adaptive technology. The Blind People in Charge name is a metaphor. Literally, blind people are in charge of the center. All of our staff are blind. It also symbolizes blind people taking charge of our own destinies, which is one of the purposes of the center, to challenge each other and build confidence. Our vision statement is blind people empowering each other to be employed, independent, and free. Our mission statement is blind people empowering each other to increase skills and confidence using a non-custodial approach, meaning it's not about sighted people doing things for us. It's about blind people ourselves doing things for ourselves. Our model is about lived experience. I can't think of anything better than blind people learning from other blind people who know what it's like to be blind and live this every day. Some of the skills that we teach at the center, there's a range. We teach Braille, which is a six dot tactile reading system invented by a young blind boy in France over 200 years ago. His name was Louis Braille. He invented this code and changed the world for blind people. We also teach technology, screen reading software, iPhones, smartphones using keyboard commands or finger gestures to make the devices talk. We basically teach people how to use technology without a screen or a mouse. 
also teach cane travel. One of the most foundational skills, being able to get around on your own independently, having that sense of freedom and the choice. This is vital for a sense of agency. It can take a while to integrate these skills and feel comfortable and competent to be able to do them. We have a range of participants, all different ages, people who just lost their sight and people who have been blind their whole life. The diversity is wonderful. It provides an opportunity for mentorship. Students from all different backgrounds working together and sharing their experiences with each other and learning from each other. This creates valuable partnerships and a world of opportunity. We teach using a model called structure discovery. This is an academic term. Essentially, it's about teaching blind people how to problem solve and use cues in the environment to figure out where we are and orientate ourselves. For example, we might feel the sun on our faces, which means we're heading south. We might feel the sun on the back of our heads, which means we're going north. We use the sound of traffic. Is it a one-way, a two-way? Textures on the ground to determine where we are. Is there a slant, which could mean it's a driveway? Is there a crown in the road? This is very different from a more traditional custodial approach, which is used in the traditional agencies that teach blindness skills and rehabilitation. They tend to use a model called guided learning, which promotes the memorization of routes and steps to accomplish something. For example, if someone wants to learn how to use their cane to get from school to home and back, they memorize the route. One block this way, two blocks to the right. If they want to learn another route, like how to get to their friend's house, they then go back to the agency, who often has a sighted people who helps the blind person learn another route, memorize another route. We teach a whole spectrum of skills in our program. It's about helping a person take charge of their own lives and learn how to navigate the world as independently as possible. We use what we call learning shades, soft, comfortable, covering over the eyes, blindfolds. We use these when we teach as a tool because it can be very distracting when you have some residual vision and many blind people do. I know for myself, I have a little bit of sight and it can get me into a lot of trouble when I try to rely on it exclusively. This helps people build confidence because they know if they can do it without any sight, then they can just incorporate their vision once they learn the skill. Challenges and successes we've had at the Pacific Training Center for the Blind. One of our challenges is that we don't have any designated core public funding. Over the years, we've done a lot of advocacy work with other blindness organizations, but it's been hard to make headway and change policy. The center is managed on very little funding. All of our funding, almost all of it, goes to direct services. But we certainly do need some core public funding to build our programs. We've had many successes. We have a lot of community support from local funding groups such as the Victoria Foundation, the United Way, an anonymous donor who supported us tremendously over the years. We also received CARF accreditation, the Commission on the Accreditation of Rehabilitation Facilities. This is an international accreditation. We received this in 2019 and it was renewed in 2021. We also earned the top national award from ABC Life Literacy. This was for our work with blind adults and braille literacy. Our biggest, biggest success by far, though, has been our participants who have taken the Blind People in Charge program and have worked so hard and accomplished so much. I'm going to read some testimonials now because their words is, of course, the best way to explain how they've changed their lives and their sense of agency. My name is Washiha. My experience at the Pacific Training Center was life-changing. I'm so glad to be able to do things that I used to enjoy doing as a sighted person. Things I took for granted, like going to the mall, going for walks and grabbing, grabbing a cup of coffee, going to unfamiliar areas and trying different routes. I learned how to travel safely and independently from the Pacific Training Center trainers. I learned how to read the traffic, cross busy roads, take a bus, and plan trips. I can also read and write braille at a good speed. My technology skills have really improved. I love that all my trainers are also blind, so they truly understood my struggles and tried to help me in whatever way they could. I'm so glad I took the opportunity and the challenge of flying all the way from Ontario to Victoria to take that journey, and I don't regret one minute of it. This is a participant now from 2016, Kashmir. I was skeptical and scared before coming to the center. I didn't think I could do things without my sight. And now I teach other people how to do things. I always used to ask for help because I thought I couldn't do it. Now I always try to do it on my own. And now, Anne, 
a senior student from 2017. It is difficult to explain to a sighted person how reassuring and empowering the ability to read and write Braille is. Not only am I happier, but I look forward to being able to apply this growing skill to find innovative solutions to problems. This ability transformed a frightening future of increasing dependency into a creative adventure of autonomy and self-reliance. This is a testimonial from Michelle, 2019. Michelle had just lost her sight. I've learned to do my own banking by audio, my own grocery shopping, cooking, and traveling everywhere, including to Vancouver for medical appointments independently. I've also learned how to count my own paper money and have started to learn Braille. When I hear about what the other students have accomplished during our discussion time, it fills me with a sense of accomplishment to try new things myself. And finally, a testimonial from Heidi. Heidi lived with her family until she was in her early 30s. Heidi was born blind. She'd always wanted to learn more skills but didn't get the chance when she was at home. Heidi came to the Pacific Training Center in 2014, and this is what she wrote about her her journey. I was not free to practice things at home and my parents were nervous about teaching me how to use the kitchen. Their general philosophy was that if I didn't know how to do something it was often easier to do it for me. Heidi wanted to work in the field of computers but she was told back then by a vocational rehab person that she could only do that as a hobby. How disappointing to know there were people out there who could limit blind people's dreams. They didn't realize there are alternative techniques to do things. So when Heidi joined us at the center, an article was written in the Goldstream Gazette by Kendra Kendra Wong, and this is some of what the article said. Heidi said when she moved out on her own, it was the best day of her life. Heidi now takes transit daily and is passionate about cooking foods from soups, salads, pastas, desserts. Heidi now works as an accessibility consultant and helps people to improve their websites. And I'm happy to say that Heidi is now working with us as an adaptive technology specialist and a teacher. Now I'm going to broaden our conversation and provide a social societal context for this topic of blindness. I went back to school last year when I was 50. I found a master's program at the University of Victoria called Community Development in the School of Public Administration. The skills and knowledge I'm gaining from this program is really helping to develop the center and my own skills. I'm currently taking an elective in social justice and community engagement, which is what spurred on this podcast project. The center is not just about providing services, it's really a grassroots movement. It's about blind people taking charge of our lives and creating our own narratives, our own history, our own future. It's about ringing the freedom bell. There's just a bit of background. Unfortunately, there's a high unemployment rate. For people with disabilities in Canada, it's over 50%. For blind people, it's up to 75 to 80%. Poverty is severe. Income levels are low. Isolation is a serious issue. There are many barriers in society for people with disabilities and blind people. Discrimination, lack of accessibility, non-inclusiveness, and not understanding on the part of sighted people and able-bodied people about what our capabilities are. One of the biggest problems that hinders the success of blind people in Canada is an overarching negative belief about blindness. This belief profoundly affects the type and quality of services available to us. A friend and colleague of mine, Graham McCreeth, wrote an outstanding book in 2010 called the, called the Politics of Blindness from Charity to Parity. This is a quote from his book. The lives of blind Canadians have changed very little since the Victorian era. Benevolent Canadians have been donating their hard-earned dollars in the name of the blind for all of these years, but there's still massive unemployment, fragmented and inadequate rehabilitation, and limited education or prospects for training. For positive change to occur, McCree says blind people must be leaders and the agent of change. Custodialism disempowers us by limiting our autonomy. Traditional rehabilitation is based based upon the custodial model. This idea that we need to be taken care of and that we can't take care of ourselves is so prevalent. Another concept that plays into the negative theme is the medical model of blindness and disability. It defines blindness as abnormal 
a symptom of a disease. The medical model says that blindness must be cured or prevented or fixed. Starkly contrasting the medical model is the social model of disability or blindness. The social model, instead of putting the onus on the individual, the social model emphasizes that the barriers are in, so are in society, and this is the main source of the problem. The social model talks about the need to get rid of these barriers for true equality. It highlights civil rights. Another theory is critical disability theory. Our center is based on critical disability theory, which critiques societal structures that contribute to the marginalization of blind people and people with disabilities. And it aims to transform the social landscape towards empowerment. This type of critical analysis provides a broader understanding of disability and blindness as a social justice issue, which is vital for profound change to happen the social justice model advocates for equitable opportunity, it challenges systemic inequalities and promotes inclusivity for all people. Nothing about us without us. This principle, created by the disability movement, emphasizes the importance of including people with disabilities in the decisions that directly impact our lives. It's also vital to consider intersectionality, Intersectionality includes many perspectives of identity, such as gender, national identity, sexual orientation, and many other backgrounds. This contributes to our diversity and our sense of empowerment. Finally, I want to talk about knowledge democracy. Our knowledge as blind people is critical and our perspective must be lifted up to promote justice and equality. All of these theories and models give a broader understanding for blindness and disability in the social justice space. Now I want to shift focus to our future, talk about some ideas for moving forward in a positive way. That's what social justice is about. It's about learning and understanding and working together to make change. One, advocacy. As blind people, we want and need to be vocal advocates. Our voice matters and your voice matters, and we need your support so that we can reach our goals of equality. Two, partnerships. At the center, we work at building partnerships in the community. Such alliances help to further our cause. Change happens when we work together. Three, our stories. Our stories are powerful, and if you can help to share our stories, this could challenge stereotypes and stigmas and educate people about a more positive idea of blindness and help us break down barriers. If you have any ideas of how we can do this work, we would love to hear from you. Funders, academics, policymakers, community members, we want to have this conversation with you. So please like us on our Facebook page, Pacific Training Center for the Blind. Visit our website, pacifictrainingcenter.ca. And of course, please share our new podcast, The Freedom Bell. Thank you so much for listening today. I look forward to talking with you all again soon.